For every $10,000 that you make, you have to make a hundred mistakes. I went all in on being a poor hippie living in a van. He went on to build a 100K a month agency. I had less than four grand in my bank account. If you can find a way to give people what they're looking for, you're going to get everything you want in return. There's businesses that don't even have a website. I closed two clients that second Friday. Probably one of the biggest things that's allowed me to get to where I'm at today in business. Start with this, Jared, are you a professional snowboarder yet or? <laughs> No, I'm not a professional snowboarder. When's that going to happen? Um, I don't think it ever will really, right? Because I make enough money doing other things uh, that I don't have to make money off of my snowboarding. But really the goal behind all the snowboarding is to just see how far I can take it. I didn't really have the opportunity when I was a kid or a teenager to chase being an extreme athlete or a professional athlete. Uh, so now that I have more resources, more um, freedom, uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm focused on is just seeing if I can ride at the level of all the pros that's, and maybe become friends with them and ride with them one day too. That's crazy. So I know you have a seven figure agency, a bunch of other businesses, and we'll definitely get into that, but what's the craziest snowboarding trick that you could do or that you've landed? Yeah. So definitely be the backflip. Um, so I just got that down this season. I've been training for it. it. It's, it's very scary to go upside down, especially when you're going high in the air as well. Um, so I've been training for that, not only physically, but with my mindset as well. I've got a great mindset coach. Uh, but yeah, backflip off of a cliff. I landed this season and uh, this last season, which back was... Backflip off of a cliff? Yeah, not a huge cliff. It's like <laughs> eight or 10 feet. But yeah, so that was that's my trick so far. Now I'm working on some some different like flips and spins. We call them corks. So That's yeah. cool, man. Um, so before you uh, obviously went deep into snowboarding, I know that one of the main reasons you started your business was because, you know, you want to live a life of freedom. You want to be able to live life on your terms, travel the world, do extreme sports and really do the things that you're passionate about. Um, so why don't we go way back? Like, I'd, I'd love to hear your story, how you got here. For those of you guys that don't know, Jared uh, was one of my students and uh, he went on to build a 100K a month agency. And uh, he has a really powerful story. So I wanted to bring him on today to really have him share his story, some of his golden nuggets along the way. And like, I'm, I learned a lot from this guy, even before we started recording today, I've been asking him all the questions <laughs> because he's such an amazing individual. It's not just about making money for you. It's also about, you know, living life how you want to live it. And I think that's really special. And one of the things I tell people is like, before you chase your passion, you have to make money and be practical. And it sounds like you've been able to take that first step, make money, and now you're living a life doing the things that you love. So that's really cool. I feel like you're winning, you know? Yeah. I, sometimes it feels like I'm winning. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's life. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I really like what you said about, you know, chasing passion there that definitely is what it's all about for me. And it's, it's always been about that less about the money, but the money gives you the freedom to do the things that you want to do, right. And to build the life that you want to live. Um, but yeah, this all started for me really early. I kind of would maybe break down my story into three phases. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the first was like my, my early years I had maybe a somewhat unique childhood. Um, we all have our traumas, right? I actually saw some of your videos recently, Joel, talking about what it was like to move to the US from Venezuela when you were a kid and the trauma that you went through there in Venezuela and that your family went through. Um, I think we all can relate to that, right? We all have some little bit of trauma. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's you know on a different scale than, than someone else's. But for me, um, you know, that trauma puts us in a position to either play a victim role and let that control our lives, or it gives us a stepping stone to build off of, right? And, and something to look back and say, that's what things were before, and this is where things are now, and this is where I'm working towards. So like when I was a kid, um, I, I didn't have the best upbringing. Uh, my mom was addicted to crack cocaine. And when I, um, you know, when I was 10, even nine years old, I was cooking dinner for myself which, you know, nine, 10 year old kids shouldn't really have to do that. Um, but that's just kind of where our family was at at the time. Uh, when I was 12, my grandparents actually took me in. Uh, so they essentially adopted me and made sure I had everything we need. We didn't have a ton, uh, you know, we weren't wealthy or anything, but we had what we needed and they made sure that I was going to school. Um, 
you know, I think it was during that time that I realized, number one, I don't want the life that my mom had, right? I, I don't want to grow up and be an adult uh, and not be able to support my family or be so addicted to drugs that, I, you know, I'm not even present on a daily basis. So I started to lean on school. I was always a pretty intelligent kid. I was always a pretty smart kid. And I was starting to realize that, um, you know, that was that was something I was good at, was learning. So I started to lean into that and focus on school, uh, took a lot of AP classes in high school. And the goal and what my parents or my grandparents always pushed on me was, you need to go to college, you need to get a bachelor's or a master's, or if you wanna go get a PhD, you'll go do that. And then you're gonna have a good job you're going to go work as a scientist. That's what I went to school for. Uh, and you're going to make a good amount of money. You're going to be able to have a decent home and you're going to be able to have a family. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> when I got to that point, right, when I got to the point of being out of school, it wasn't that clear cut, right? Like I wasn't making the money I thought I would make. And I had also developed myself along the way to want something a little bit more than just the the good life, the American standard, like mm -hmm. nuclear family. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I got started out. You know, it was the, the trauma was just really a driver for me to push to something better. And things really started to change further when I, when I did start my career and when I realized that, you know, that career wasn't going to make me enough money. So I did something, you know, kind of out of the box, especially like none of my friends or family really understood what I was doing. I, um, I actually quit all my jobs. So I actually, after I finished school, I was working as an environmental scientist for a nonprofit. I was working as a surf forecaster for the biggest surf forecasting website in the world. They're called Surfline. Uh, and I was also running a valet parking company that I had been working for, you know, throughout my years in college and grad school. I quit all of those jobs and, um, you know, it's just really, Trying what led to you to quit? And you were, one day you were like, <laughs> it was actually pretty funny. Actually, an old friend, like my high school best friend, and this was you know six years after we had finished high school, he had come over on Thanksgiving one day, like just to hang out, and we started talking. We hadn't talked in a long time, and he basically drove me to the point of realizing that I was just searching for myself. I was spending all of the money that I had that I was making on surf trips and on traveling and trying to see the world and, and learn who I was. And he was like, Jared, why don't you just do that? Like, why are you even working if you have no extra money, if you're spending it all to go leave here, leave your home and travel to other places and you come back, you wait for your next paycheck and then you leave again, why are you even doing that? And I was like, you know what? That doesn't make sense. I don't need to work to be happy. If surfing around the world makes me happy, why don't I just go live where the surfing is? Do you feel like that was the first time in your life where you were like, I'm going to not just focus on making money, but also really get clear on the life that I want to live and then reverse engineer what needs to happen in order to live that life? Yeah, yeah. It was more of I, I was pretty confident that I knew I didn't even really need money. All I needed was my dog and my surfboard and some friends around me um, so I could you know, have a community. And so and you were like 23 that time? Uh, yeah, I was 22? actually, I was 24, 24. Okay. Yeah. And I actually, I had gone through a pretty hard breakup as well. That was like my, my first really big breakup. And so I was just in this weird space where I wanted to figure out what it was that I wanted to do with my life. And I knew right now, or at that time, I just, I just wanted to surf because that made me feel good. So I quit my jobs. Um, I terminated the lease on my condo that I was living in and bought a really, really shitty travel trailer for like $2,400. It was so bad. I pulled it behind my Audi out to California with my dog. We hopped in there. And that was kind of like the start of, I think, a, a lot of things changing for me. But mm -hmm. it was very scary, right? It was, it was probably, I remember, um, I remember leaving town in my car, right? And my, my university was in my hometown. I got my bachelor's and my master's there. So I was around my family. I was around my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, you know, my immediate family were all there in town. And this was my first time leaving, not just to go on a short trip and come back. So I remember being about an hour outside of town and just breaking down crying because I was so scared. It was something brand new to me. I had never just gone off and thrown, kind of thrown my caution to the wind and said, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm just following my passion. 
and everything is either going to work out or or it's not. So you went all in, it sounds like. I went all in on being a poor hippie living in a van. Yeah. I yeah. even had a mustache. Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my hair was uh, was touching my shoulders. My uh, my fiance, when we that had met, she used to put it in a ponytail. <laughs> That's cool. So, man, that must have been really scary, you know, to like leave everything you've ever known. You know, and I talk about that all the time. Every time you want to level up in life, whether it's spiritually, financially, uh, you know, intellectually, you have to essentially kill your old identity. And, and that creates space for the new version of you to uh, come through. So it sounds like you did that. Yeah. And I, I don't even think I realized I was doing it. I was just trying to follow what made me feel good at the time, what I was passionate about at the time. And, you know, I, I went to California first and the goal was just to go down to Central America. I have a friend that owns a hostel down there, a surf hostel. So I'd already talked to him and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to come down. I'm going to live there indefinitely, right, and, until I decide to leave. And so, you know, I was on my way there um, and decided, you know, I wanted to take advantage of the rent, rest of the winter and go snowboarding in California. Uh, so I stopped there and, and actually was actually there. I got a job as a lift operator at the mountain. And I know, I know you snowboard. So those guys get paid like guys and girls, I should say they get paid like nothing, like absolute minimum wage. And they just press a, a button, a green button for the lift to go and a red button for it to stop. It's like really basic shit. Right. And I have got a master's degree. Like obviously it, it wasn't the right fit, but I took a job as a lift operator to get a free ski pass. And the first day I showed up, right, I've got my travel trailer, you know, I'm, I'm planning to just camp on the side of the road and, and live there for, you know, two or three months before I went down to Central America. And the first day I got there, I um, met my fiance, she was training with me to be a lift operator. And she was doing the same thing, like very educated, just quit her career. She was working for Condé Nast, which is like a, a very large magazine conglomerate, they own like Vogue and tech magazine. So she was working in Manhattan. Um, and we met there the first day and she had this lime green, um, ambulance that she actually bought here in Denver and converted into a tiny home. So oh, wow. I met her and I was like, Hey, I see you're like, you know, we're working together. I see you're camping yeah, see on your the side lime, of the road. Lime green van. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, you know, you're camping. I've got my dog with me and I'm a nice guy. So like, if you want to camp near each other, like we can keep each other safe. Like we're both new here. And, you know, pretty quickly, Instead we ended of up sliding like, into the DMs. You said <laughs> yeah. we can line our vans next to each other. <laughs> yeah, we slid <laughs> into the campground. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we met and I ended up inviting her to to come down to Central America with me. She loved my dog and we got along really well. We were in the same place in life. So we took the next it was about nine months and traveled through Central America we spent a bunch of time in Mexico, mostly because our ambulance broke down there. Our transmission blew and we had like almost no money and like it was it was a whole thing. But spent a bunch of time in Mexico, Guatemala and most of our time in El Salvador because that was like where I had some friends and, and where our kind of core destination was. Wow. So you really like completely quit everything. I, I quit everything. I was doing, world. yeah, I was doing like a little consulting work on the side just to bring in some money, like the valet parking company that I had been working for, for my entire time in college. Um, and even after college, uh, the owner of that company was paying me to write proposals for different, different places. And, um, and we'll get into this later, but one of those proposals was for the city of Aspen. And that actually is, is what brought me back to the U S and brought me to Colorado. Um, but yeah, like we, we were barely making any money. You know, I was probably bringing in like a thousand bucks a month which was just enough for us to eat and pay for, for fuel in our ambulance. And were, we were you worried around. about making more money back then? Or was it just like, let's live a good I, life? Yeah, we, we weren't worried about it. And you know, my, my main thing was like, I had pretty good credit at the time. I, of course I killed it <laughs> <laughs> on that trip, but I had pretty good credit. So I was like, you know what, I'll max out my credit cards if I need to, and I'll figure it all out later if, if everything's going wrong. Um, so we, we essentially stayed there until we were running were out of you, money. Were you in touch with your mom or your grandparents? Yeah, I was, I was definitely in touch with my family. What and did they think about all this? They were surprisingly supportive. Um, at first when I told them it was going to happen, they were not on board. They were like, what do you mean? Like you just got your master's degree. You have all this student debt. You're so smart. Why are you going to quit your career? Um, and I was like, guys, I, I just have to do this. Like I'm not happy 
I'm not living the life that I want to live or the life that I thought I'd be able to live. Um, so they, they eventually jumped on board, but always, always with, um, an air of caution, right? They're always making sure that everything was going okay. Jared, do you need, do you need us to send you money? We can send you 200 bucks or whatever it is. We want to make sure you guys and the dog are eating, right? Like, so they, they were there, they had my back. It was nice to have the the safety net there. And when we did break down a couple times in Mexico, cause we we're driving around this ambulance from 1996, right? Um, when we did break down, you know, the family was, was right there like, Hey, we can send you 400 bucks. Will that help? Yes, please, please send it. Cause, cause we could really use it right now. That's cool, man. Cause I feel like, have you ever read the way of the superior man? No, I haven't. David Dita? Yeah. It's, he says that man's mission is number one, like doing what you believe in your heart is the best thing for you as a man is, is, is the number one thing that you should always be doing. And even if your friends your family members, your teachers disagree with you. And, uh, you know, his theory is that if you follow that, ultimately it'll benefit not just you, but everyone around you, which as we'll get to it, fast forward to now, like I'm sure that decision led to who you are now and all of your success and, um, oh, yeah. and so much more, you know, yeah, I think that even though in that moment it was scary and, and oh. you're probably questioning, is this really what I should be doing with my life? You know? Oh yeah. I questioned it over and over again. Um, but I think the biggest thing I learned there is, you know, we can project a future image, a future idea of what the, what something is going to be like, but it's really just a projection, right? We can plan all we want. We can put all of the notes in place, whatever it may be that you do in your planning but it's all just a projection. And what I learned there was like, I had to be adaptable, right? If, if our van broke down and we were stuck and we had no money, we just had to figure it out. Like there was no other option and it wasn't according to plan. And what I realized there was almost nothing goes according to plan. Um, my fiance and I, well, obviously now we're engaged at the time. She was my girlfriend. We had a saying and it was just because things went wrong all the time when you're living in a van and like being in a new culture and in true poverty, um, we had a saying and it was just, it's fine, right? Like something would go wrong and we would just look at each other and say, it's fine. And we would try to put a smile on our faces and try to find a way to get through whatever that was. And that, that was us learning how to adapt. And I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things that's allowed me to get to where I'm at today in business was was that learning to adapt and actually really being forced to adapt but taking that to heart realizing that adaptation is required if you're going to reach a goal um, or maybe you even have to adapt what the goal is as you're going right like you and i were talking about goals earlier and how those things might be changing for for both of us all the time right we're always evolving so you um at this point you're in south america central america central america yeah and then so where, where, do, where did you go from here? Did you just stay there? Yeah. For- so we were down in El Salvador, um, just spending my time surfing. Um, my, my fiance is not a surfer, but she enjoyed hanging out by the beach and we spent, it was, it was actually a, a pretty cool lifestyle. It was maybe a little bit more low, slow paced and, and boring than what I prefer, but we actually spent just all of our time, um, cooking food and hanging out with each other. Like I would go surfing early in the morning at sunrise and then I would ride my, I had a dirt bike down there. I would ride my dirt bike to the fish market with a backpack. I'd fill up my backpack with fresh fish and then go to the vegetable market, which was right there next to the pier and stuff the rest with vegetables. And have you ever had horchata? It's like this, sure it's I like have, a Mexican yeah. rice drink. It's like sweet and delicious. They would sell it in, in bags that are tied off and you would just bite a hole in the bag and drink it. So I would just go buy like, 10 of those for 25 cents each. And this was like my daily routine. I just go get us, you know, fresh food wow. so we could cook, you know, lunch and dinner. And then we would spend all day just, um, just hanging out and cooking. But we ran out of money and I had been, like I said, working with the owner of the the valet company that I previously, you know, worked with and, and just writing proposals for, for different valet parking contracts around the country, uh, around the U S and one with the city of Aspen started to pan out. You know, we were running out of money. So I, I called up my now business partner, John, and I was like, hey man, I see this thing with Aspen is panning out. And I know like you've got kids, you don't really wanna be traveling between Florida and Aspen, which is, which is where the company was based. 
I was like, why don't we start this up together as partners? I have no money, so you, you can give me the money. You taught me all the skills, right? I've got all the systems. So let's just jump in on this together and score this contract with the city of Aspen. So we reached out and said, yeah, we'd, we'd love to meet with you guys. You guys are interested in our services. Um, so we'll, we'll come out. So I actually drove in like, it was like in 10 days, drove from El Salvador to Colorado, to Aspen, Colorado, to meet with them. I got my hair cut, shaved my mustache. Like, dude, my hair was like well beyond my shoulders. And wow. like I had it in a ponytail every day at that point. I was, I was definitely a class A hippie. You would look at me and be like, that guy is never going to do anything in business. Wow. <laughs> Um, that's cr that's yeah. crazy, you know, yeah. and because you now it's like I see you as a world class entrepreneur, you know, that's yeah. continuing to grow and evolve and and adapt, create and adapt. <laughs> so 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 you, th did that bring you back to Aspen? That brought me back to Aspen. So, yeah, we I mean, I was originally from Florida, I'd never been to Aspen, um, had this opportunity essentially to potentially gain a large contract for a company that we hadn't even started yet, which, you know, which was a good opportunity for me. It was my first opportunity to have a business of my own. And the way I was seeing it at the time was that it would be my first opportunity at creating a passive income, um, which, which I was able to do. So we, we drove from El Salvador up to, um, up to Colorado, scored the contract and basically got set up to start, start doing valet parking in downtown Aspen, Colorado. So did your income, like grow a lot at that point or not really? No, I was more of an, um, I was definitely more of an entrepreneurial employee. I was definitely working in my business every day for a couple of years. And then I did get to the point where I was able to fire myself from daily operations aside from like, you know, higher level management type of stuff, but it wasn't a huge company. Um, we were bringing in some money, but it was, it was really just paying the bills. I found pretty quickly though, um, after we started doing this but valet to Aspen, wasn't that super expensive, super expensive. It also meant that all of our customers, um, at our valet service, which was like, it was, a, it was sponsored by the city. It was like a, for, for all the restaurants and shops in the downtown area there. So we were parking cars, um, during lunchtime and during dinner time for the richest people in the world. Like Aspen is one of the most wealthy pockets in the entire world. So we've got billionaires and celebrities and just athletes. The athletes, ultra rich people all over the place. And so I realized, okay, we've got all of these Range Rovers. We park like, just crazy. You we went park from, like you 30 went Range Rovers a night. Living in, you know, on the beach. And now you're in the, one of the richest cities in the entire world. Yeah. Yep, exactly. You and know, so it's like when you go to Aspen, you know, it's just, it's just a different feeling. It's a way different feeling. If you haven't been to Aspen, like, like even go going there even and going, you will be the poorest person. I guarantee you. <laughs> even like biking, you like bike and you're like looking at the houses. Like it's crazy, you know? Yep. It's like yeah. some of the most I mean, beautiful, gorgeous architecture in the world. Yeah. Go to, go to Zillow and maybe we can put a pop-up of this as well. Just a Zillow search in Aspen. There aren't houses at all for less than $5 million. In fact, you can buy a trailer for about $800,000. Wow. I kid you not. A mobile home is going for about 800 grand there right now. Um, so yeah, we found ourselves in this rich pocket and we realized if we had all these expensive cars, I could just clean them. I could have my staff clean them for... So you were probably getting into some of the nicest cars in the world as well. Yeah, yeah. It's super. I mean, it, any any car you want to you talk about, I've driven them all. They're all, you know, they're all very common in Aspen. We started cleaning them and spun off of the valet company, a detailing company, um, which is still running in the Aspen area today. And... Yeah, you know, that's that's where the thing started to change a little bit. So I had my valet parking company running. I had my valet guys cleaning cars. I now had a separate set of customers and in the detailing business. did anyone teach business. you business or were you just like figuring it out? I would say I was probably figuring it out, but I, I am lucky to have, you know, the guy that owned the valet parking company that I worked for for a long time. He had kind of trained me up. Yeah, he was one of my mentors and, you know, trained me to run his company originally. Um, and I did that for several years. So I, I had some experience, but I was definitely learning as I went hundred percent. Wow. Yep. And then detailing, you did that. How yeah. did you, was this close to when you started the agency or not? Yeah. Not yeah. Really. So it was, it was fairly close. And why so would you start the agency if you had a detailing business and the valet company, like walk us through that and how you got here and, and really maybe how we met. Yeah. I love that. So, um, 
I started up the detailing that started to run and I started to get staff that could run it without me having to be super present. Right. So I'm no longer parking cars myself. I'm no longer detailing cars myself. Now I've got time. Right. And so I'm starting to look at, all right, I've got time. My bills are being paid by my, my couple of small businesses here in Aspen. What am I going to do next? And I, you know, I'm a big proponent of traditional education. I know probably a lot of your listeners aren't, and I'm totally cool with that. Um, we all have our different path, but I, I adapt very well, well to traditional education. So I've we, actually we can, got, we can come back to that at the end. I want to finish your story first, but there's like a few points that I actually want to go over later. If yeah, we can definitely riff on it. Um, so we have to battle it out. Only okay. one will remain. No, I'm just kidding. We can battle it out. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm all kidding. there. <laughs> no, I have a tour. I tore my ACL. I'm not going to battle anyone. <laughs> Just going to um, sit in my chair. <laughs> um, yeah. So I had the time back and I, I actually have a family member. My uncle's, uh, my uncle's partner, she, she owns a medium sized fitness company and she was kind of always like you said the fitness? person that I, what was that? You said fitness. Yeah. Fitness okay. company. So she has a, a fitness uh, system basically that she had been selling. It's been over 20 years now she's been selling it. Um, but I always saw her as like the family member that, you know, new stuff, right? She was a successful entrepreneur. I think she had years where she made, you know, upwards of 15, $20 million a year. So she was successful, right? Super successful. So I called her up and I was like, Hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about going back to school for business. I want to learn how, how I can take my business to the next level. I'm going to apply to Wharton next week. She went to Wharton, right? And if, if you guys don't know, Wharton's, uh, known as the best business school in the world. I was a great student, so I could probably get in there, hopefully. Um, but I'm sure you could, yeah. Maybe. But basically, I told her that, and she was like, Jared, um, fuck that. Don't go to business school. You still have student debt from your last bit of school, and I like you can learn way more from me. So she said, Jared, come work for me. You can be my data analyst, right? Because I was a scientist. All, everything I was focused on was collecting data and analyzing data for my whole career. Um, so she said, come work for me as my business analyst. And I'll pay you not enough money. I won't say how much it was, but I'll pay you hourly. Not a lot of money. I would have made more money as a snowboard instructor um, in Aspen. But I was like, you know what? I'll take this opportunity. I'll get to learn from her and work side by side her and, you know, pick up some things about business. Um, so I jumped into that. And, you know, my two businesses were running on the side. I had to put in probably five, 10 hours a week to make sure those were good. And, you know, started jumping into her business and learning about analytics of a business of a, of a real business, like a medium sized business that's actually doing a real amount of revenue. And I found pretty quickly, you know, having data skills already, uh, that her biggest issues with her expenses and her income were around marketing. Right. And at that time it was like, okay, well, I've run a couple of Google ads for my own business. I know a little bit about this marketing stuff, but let me really dive into what her agency that she contracted out was doing. And as I was doing that, I was like, holy shit, this agency's making so much money. And I'm the one actually telling them where they need to change things because I'm looking at the business wow. data. At that point, I got on Facebook. I was like, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to run some Facebook ads. Never done this before. I said, if I can run some Facebook ads, I made all the creatives and everything for it myself. If I can run some ads to get in a couple of businesses that I can do marketing for, then I deserve those clients, right? If I can actually find clients and sell clients and I can do the same thing for them. So I had actually started running some marketing. I put maybe like a thousand bucks into paid ads, maybe 1500 bucks into paid ads. But did anyone tell you go start an agency or were you just like, I'm going to start an agency? No, well, it, it was actually Sergio. So I started doing that. I got hit with one of your ads and I was like, oh shit, these guys are like, they have a coaching program to start an agency. I, you know, I see Joel's face on the screen and you know, I, cause I'm running okay, Facebook ads. So this ads. was before you, or this was after you were already running the ads. Yeah, as a freelancer, I was just like freelance running ads. Okay, no so you were like, nothing. I'm going to just start a freelance well, I guess you were yeah, just I was like, like, I've got these data skills and if I apply them to marketing, I can charge a lot of money for that. Right. I can make people money. If I can do that, then I can charge people money. Okay. So right. you were just like working for, you said your uncle's partner. Yep. As a business analyst and marketing Who runs analyst. a massive fitness company, 15 to $20 million a year or, mm -hmm. and, and then you were essentially looking at the data. You realized, oh my God this marketing agency who I'm telling them what to do based on the data is making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I should go try to do that for other businesses. Exactly. So ran some ads, got three clients in the door. And then you I also saw think that you came up with SMMA or no, 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 not okay. at all. Not at all. I was <laughs> just there's like, there's been a few people that we interview 
including Sergio, really? who like had this idea of doing marketing for businesses, and they're like, I came <laughs> like, up with it. This is groundbreaking. It. <laughs> like, you're not the first. <laughs> you know, um, advertising agencies have been around for decades, <laughs> yep. and they're not going anywhere, by no, the way. No, they're, they're not. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, basically got on a call with Sergio, who was, I don't know why he was the salesperson on that call. Maybe you guys were getting started at that time. It was, it yeah, was we when you guys started. were seven-figure agency. Wait, wait, so slow down a second. So you were running the your own ads to get, for what? Like for to get yourself clients? Like what were the yeah, ad just creatives? To get my Yeah, just to get myself clients, I like Did you book you know, any started calls? YouTubing stuff. Yeah, I booked some calls and I didn't even know like that I should have an intro call, a demo call. I'd never done any sales and I've never been one to convince people of other things like I'm and you know, as we go on, you'll hear that. I don't, I don't want to do sales. I don't like sales. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know how to sell. So I was like, all right, I'm going to run these ads. I'll talk to some people if they need help with marketing. I don't even care what niche I didn't, I didn't even think of the word niche at that point in time. If they need marketing, maybe I can help them and, you know, run some ads for them. And then how did that go? Did you get, yeah, I got, I, I signed three clients. Um, one was a, uh, wow. Like basically all just self-taught, like, yeah, just self-taught YouTube. Yeah, I went to YouTube University for the marketing stuff. You didn't watch my free course because it wasn't I didn't, out back I didn't then. even know it was there. Like the no, first no, ad. The, the free course. <laughs> the first ad I saw of you, I clicked on it. I booked a call. I was like, oh, these guys are doing something cool, teaching people how to start an agency. So yeah, got on that sales call with Sergio. And That's on that my call, business partner. You guys have seen him on the YouTube channel, but we were just starting out. And I, I, I believe that at first you need to do the unscalable before you try to scale. So we're like how do I do as much client success as possible? How does Sergio get on the sales calls himself? Cause then you get to intimately know the business before you try to put people in place. Yep. Like I think a lot of people actually try to scale too quickly and automate. And I'm like, sometimes it's actually good to not automate at first. So you just, understand the process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And I think, um, I, I, I listened to some guy that said, Oh, I only start businesses with an operator in place. And I think that's smart, but you should, you can still be extremely involved in the day to day at first, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important to do that. So, you know, especially if you're the business owner, like if something goes wrong and nobody else knows how to solve it, you, yeah, it should be you that can solve it. Absolutely. Okay. So then you see our ad, you click on it. At this point, you're just like, I'm going to try the freelancing thing or you were already like, I'm doing an agency. Like, what was your mindset well, at there? So, you know, I got on the phone with the team. It all sounded good. I was like, wow. And honestly, I, I left the call thinking, wow, this could actually, you know, change my life. I can take these skills that I know I already have. Like, I've seen them work um, and I can build a real business out of this and I could build a business that makes $100,000 a month. I was like, wow, these people are making $100,000 a month. So... I, I didn't have money at the time. I had less than four grand in my bank account. Me and my now fiance were, we were struggling, um, you know, to have extra cash living in such an expensive area. Like our rent at the time was almost four grand a month. And, and that's, a, you know, that's a lot for two people, especially two people in their mid twenties that really aren't in a, a stable career, right? We had our two businesses and she was actually working at dispensaries, like selling weed at dispensaries. Um, so we, we didn't have anything extra at that time, really. And, you know, I, I heard the price of the program. I didn't have enough. And there was a payment plan. And, you know, essentially, like, I would have had to take all the money that I had in our in our bank account, all the, every penny that we had, and put it into this coaching program and still be able to make my rent at the end of the month. So, you know, I told Sergio, the sales guy, I was like, you know what, dude, I have to, I love this. I think it's amazing. I think I could really succeed here. In fact, I told him I'll probably be one of your best students ever. Um, cause that's, wow, I was that's cocky cool. about being a student. You know, I'm, I'm actually a very good student. <laughs> um, but you know, I waited for, for my now fiance to get home from work and you know, I, I sat her down and I was like, babe, there is this opportunity that I saw and I truly believe it's going to change our lives. And I started to tear up. I was like, I really think this is it. Can I spend this money and can we invest this in me so that I can try to make something bigger for us? So I can try to do something bigger for us. And she, she went for it. Right. And like with, with the premise that I truly believe that this building an agency and following, you know, following other people that had done it before, would be able to change my life. That's cool, man. And then what happened? Yeah, my, my life changed. <laughs> it changed pretty quickly. So, um, you know, I, I took the money that we had and put it into the coaching program, uh, knowing that I had to sell clients 
very quickly. Like within the first three weeks, I had to sell clients. So you, but you didn't sign up right away, right? I took about four days. I think I took like the weekend to think about it. And in the middle of that, um, I, you know, as I was pondering all this, like I, I've got business school floating around in my head. I've got this thing that's new to me of, you know, online coaching programs. It was a, a new form of education that I wasn't really aware of very much. Were you like skeptical of the industry? Cause I know like our industry, especially with, you don't need anyone could just say, I'm a coach. You know, you see all these people that hit $10,000 a month, the first, you know, once, and they're like, I know how to scale an agency. It's like, you really don't, you know? Whereas me, Sergio, Isaac, all scaled our seven figure agencies. We had done multiple millions before we ever taught anything. Um, that being said, there's a lot of bad players in our industry. Were you skeptical or not? I, at all? I was definitely a bit skeptical for me. That amount of money was a lot at the time. Um, so that was the biggest thing. Which is that crazy, was crazy, by the way, because you would have put it into college without blinking an eye. You know? I, and I did. My, my education cost. A side note, it's a fascinating uh, thing to think about that people will just dump their money in and not even bat an eye and be like, wow, that's a lot of money. But as soon as it's something else outside of what is known and comfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm comfortable to drop money on coaching programs. I do it all the time. Like a lot of money. I bet you do too. Yeah. I've, for sure. I've got a coach that I pay five grand a month to personally, you know, and like before I would have never, never, ever considered that. I would have been like, that's a horrible idea. That's a bad investment. So you were a little skeptical. I was definitely a bit skeptical, but what really turned the tables, um, and we're going to get a little bit raunchy here, I guess. Um, while I was trying to decide and I had all this stuff floating around in my head, trying to you know, just figure out which path was the best for me. Um, I smoked some DMT, so I, I've been a, you know, I've been a recreational, um, drug user, I would say for, you know, for most of my time since I, you know, graduated college or, You're a hippie you know, since deep I was down. A, I'm a hippie deep down for sure. And I think, you know, if you use drugs in the right way and you don't abuse them, you know, it's, it's okay. I've never had any drug addiction problems myself or any, you know, desire to, to be in that space. But I think certain drugs can be used as a tool, whether it's, releasing something or helping you to realize something like with psychedelics. I know that's kind of a hot topic in the world right now, the last few years. Um, but yeah, I smoked some DMT and, um, if you don't know, DMT is a pretty, uh, pretty internal and short, but intense trip where, where you really get, get inside your mind, start thinking about things that are deep, maybe even things that subconsciously were there that you didn't even realize. And it came pretty clear to me that I needed to, to take the next step in being a bigger entrepreneur. And that was the opportunity that was in front of me. That was seven figure agency. See, it's, it's, it's almost back to that moment where you quit your jobs and you went all in. Yeah. Yeah. And I it's, did. it's, it's like, you have to keep killing your identity to get to the next level. And it's so scary. And it, you know, and you know, the, the part of the moments when it's scariest is also when you're comfortable, you know, it's like, I feel like I still have to kill my identity. We've been, we talked about it before the podcast, like, um, how do you continue to do that? Like we can do anything we want in this life, but you have to essentially r hit a reset button on who you are if you want to keep evolving and adapting. Yep. But it sounds like th that happened again for you. It definitely did. And it, and it has several times since I think I've since that first time that I really dropped my ego and, you know, left my hometown and, you know, went off and threw caution to the wind. Um, it's become easier and easier to put the ego aside and, and, try to truly realize the reality, right? And I say truly realize the reality of, of what it is that I want. And I've always been a very analytical person and I can tell you are as well, Joel, since we've been talking a lot today. Um, but you know, I, it, sometimes it does take redefining yourself and allowing yourself to be something different than you thought you were someone different than you thought you were, you were, you were going to be, uh, and that's okay. Right. As long as you have the right motivation behind it. And mine, I've realized my motivation is just to follow my passion, right? To do what it is that makes me happy in my life. And, you know, I think these evolutions of my, my ego, of my image, of my character, um, have all just been, you know, me growing and becoming an adult and, and realizing that what I maybe thought I wanted isn't really what I want anymore. And now I get to redirect myself. Mm, that's really cool, man. And I, that resonates with me a lot. Um, so what happened? So you joined the program and then what happened? Yeah. So I joined the program and, um, 
you know, like I said, I had this tight window where I had to start making money. 24 hours? No, No, (laughs) not even close. That's not possible. But I think I did pretty good. Um, I was able to, I I picked a niche, as I was told. You had a little Google form niche calculator at the time. By the way, I've got a cool, cool newer version of that. That's pretty awesome. I'll share it with you later. Um, but you had your niche calculator, which basically, which, by the way, we give away for free now. Yeah. Do you, you still have that thing? You out know there? What's, can, can we just say something like, do you know that the, the program you initially went through, like we give it away for free, like the seven figure agency course, like it's out there. We wanted to make it accessible to everyone. And it, you know, if they want to invest, it's only in the coaching. Like we believe that if we want to help the most amount of people, you should actually give all of your courses away 100% for free and not charge a single dollar. And if you're actually valuable and you can help people, then you know, you've know you earned the right to charge for coaching. Um, can you just tell people that that's the same course you went yeah, through? Yeah, I mean, same thing I went through. Just so that they know it's like a real, uh, it's, it's, there, there's no magical other course. <laughs> can we just? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, of course it was, it was that, it was the content in there. And then I did have coaching, right? I, I got to jump on the, the weekly calls or the daily calls that were laid out every day of the week. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's the same knowledge. That was the, that was the start of everything for me. And, and as we're you know going to continue to talk about, like things are a lot different, dude. My life is like 100% different than it was. Which is amazing, man. Yeah. I'm proud of you, man. Thank you. I'm proud of you too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 Built, built some big things here. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, hearing your story, I was like getting emotional because it's like sometimes we forget to take a step back and think about the impact that it has on people. It's just always like, SM- I'm always like, oh, I'm talking about marketing agencies, SMMA, but you don't realize that it's people's lives, you know? Yeah. It's people's lives. And, you know, that's our, our clients as well, right? Like as marketing agencies, we're trying to help people accomplish their goals, right? They've got their business desires and their business goals, but really those all just lead to a personal goal. Um, so at the end of the day, as marketers, we're impacting people's lives as well. And, um, I think that realization is important to carry through. Yeah, I think so too. I think like, uh, it's easy to also lose that along the way, but realize like, we were talking before the podcast, one of the things I wrote down is focus on helping people. And it's not that we're not focused on helping people, but we don't think about that all the time. Whereas like if I create content for you guys and I'm thinking, how can I help you guys? That's always going to fuel me much more than just like creating a random SMMA video. Mm -hmm. Um, so like the same thing for an agency, if you're thinking, how can I really help this person? Um, it's, it's probably going to let you create better ads, do better work, like come up with better solutions, even though you're Mm -hmm. just an agency. I think it's just a better frame, uh, through which you can look at your business and through which you can look at the world. Yeah. And the easiest way to know that you're helping people is to be giving them things that you know are valuable to them for free. Just like you're saying, right. That, that old seven figure agency course that I originally jumped into is something that's out there for free. And you know, that's, that's really where we should all be focusing our energy. If you truly want to help people, um, start giving them value and give it to them for free. That's, that's, what's going to make the difference. And what I've found and what I've heard from so many successful entrepreneurs, like I'm so you know fortunate that my circle has been growing, um, to include some just really amazing and powerful and influential people. Um, what I'm realizing is if you can share with people, how they can accomplish their dreams and desires or how they can build wealth, you'll always have enough wealth for yourself, right? If you can find a way to truly give people value and give people what they're looking for, you're going to get everything you want in return. Yeah. You know, everyone always shits on me for saying, Oh, just focus on setting and closing appointments. You don't care about service delivery, which is bullshit. Cause you know, I cared too much about my clients to the point where it would paralyze me when I would lose one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think like, I think especially in the agency game or really any business, you really have to care about your clients and, and I think also care about them as people more than just a business too. You know, a lot of the times it's not just about running an ad. It's not just about, uh, you know, setting up their goal high level. Um, it's about getting to know them and what they want and what they care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I, I think I realized that pretty early on I was, definitely Which focused by the, on the, by the way, touch. like when I, when I ran my Atlas digital, I managed 50 clients by myself. And I like on some months we had a hundred percent retention rate because I made sure to call every single one of my clients at least once a month and tweak their ads at least three times a week, even if it was completely unscalable and I was burning myself to the ground, 
like yeah. just working so damn hard. I think, um, I think when once it, it, it's like the airplane analogy. First, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself, but then you have to pour all of your focus on the next person. I think what happens is most people just never get clients. They're always fe- freaking out. How do I get them results? How do I get them results? But you don't even have a client. Yeah, yeah, and so I, I totally see where you're at with you know book appointments, close deals. That's the first part. You can't have a business if you don't have money coming in, right? It's not a business if there's not revenue. So you have to f- first get that revenue. And I think for a lot of a lot of your audience, this is all new to them, right? Like they didn't come in with marketing experience necessarily like you or I did. And I didn't truly have marketing experience, but I had the analytical marketing side and the conceptual side down pretty well. But yeah, it's it's okay to to definitely jump in, get those sales calls, and, and sell I actually people. tell people beginners shouldn't actually charge. I I I think I get social media. It's very easy to just take one piece of what I'm saying and just say that this is your philosophy hardcore. But like I tell actually beginners all the time, you should get free trials. Um, mm-hmm. you, sh- you you should re- like for example do reactivation campaigns, yeah, score or, review or campaigns review for campaign. free. Yep. Um, or charge based on performance and put zero risk to the business owner. And your goal should be to get as much experience as possible so that you earn the right to actually charge and get paid for the work. Yep, um, I totally agree with that. But anyways, back to you. Let's So so you start the agency, you join uh, Agency Lab, and you know, you're all in. Seven-figure agency at the time. Yeah, it was called seven-figure <laughs> agency. <laughs> Old um, school OG. Yeah, and then we, we changed to Agency Lab. And then, so were you scared? Like, you just invested most of your money, like... Oh, dude, I went into it were you hardcore. Ang- anxious? You know, like were The you- second I got access to the course, I was in that shit. I was working till four or five in the morning every night. And because of that, like I was, I was like, this is my way. Like I know I can make this thing work. I've already got the skills. Most of these people here, they don't already have the marketing skills. They haven't done business before. A lot of these people, I was like, I've, I've got a good foundation here. So let me grow it. So I went through all the content started. I built my first funnel, right? I had built a couple websites in the past just for my, my other businesses, but I built my first funnel. i made my first creative or my first kind of creative assets for clients that were not complete shit and just started absorbing everything I could knowing I've got this timeline, like, or else I'm not going to be able to pay my rent and I will have, you know, basically fucked over myself and, and my, my fiance and our, our two dogs, right? Like if we can't pay to eat, that's on me. Um, it's a so lot of pressure. It was a lot of pressure, but I was excited about it. You know, I, I really thrive when I'm learning. Um, and there was so much new stuff thrown at me that I was just absorbing it. So I was staying up all night, every night for a couple weeks there. And by the end of my second full week, so I, I got access, I think on a Friday, um, I reviewed everything over the weekend, started jumping onto coaching calls on Monday. And by the end of my second business week, so that second Friday, I closed two clients that second Friday, one on a high ticket um, offer and one on a, like a mid ticket, $1,500 a month offer. So I now had $5,500 in revenue coming in two weeks after I jumped in and I was my whole team. I had actually hired a VA on Upwork for like five bucks an hour. She was, she was probably working for, I don't know, 10 hours a week or something. That's crazy. How did that feel? Dude, it, it felt it felt pretty good. So I have a, a little catchphrase. <laughs> um, I wouldn't even call it. It's not my own catchphrase, but I'll, I, it, when Just that happened, it. you know, when the first, when I closed the first one, it was a high ticket. It was, it was $4,500 a month or $4,000 a month. Um, that deal I closed, I got up from my desk, like just got off the phone, the high level phone on my, my laptop. And I just stood up and I kicked. I went, hi yeah. And like, I was like, let's go get lobster rolls, babe. So we like went and got lobster rolls because that was like the expensive thing that that we could eat that we couldn't usually afford. And so every time I closed a deal, we would go get lobster rolls um, at this place in like, you know, downtown Aspen. So, so fast forward to now, you've consumed all the lobster rolls oh, dude, in Aspen. We're, we're done with lobster rolls and we're on to Wagyu. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. So that's the yeah. phrase now. Every time you close a client, uh, yeah, yeah, and do a big kick. So oh, I thought it was let's go get some lobster rolls, babe. No, no, <laughs> it's it's hi yeah. I thought it was every time you close a client, let's go get some lobster rolls, babe. <laughs> nope. Um, but yeah, you know that first deal when I closed it, you the amount of relief I felt was just incredible. Like I I did start crying, and I'm not like a super emotional person. I'm definitely in touch with my emotions, but at that time I was less so. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, I started crying. I was so happy. I was like, yes, this is going to work. And then like a couple hours later, I closed the second deal. And I was like, holy shit, like this really is going to work. I can do this. I can, if I can close a deal a week or something, I'm going to have like this real thriving business very soon, like in the next couple of months. And now I have enough money to pay, pay my coaching, you know, program fees, pay for seven figure agency, agency lab fees. Like things are, things are on the right track. And I've got my other businesses that are paying most of our bills. And like, you know, those are running as, as small businesses that make a little bit of money. So things were, were starting to come together at that point. Wow. And then tell us about like, you picked the niche. Did you do cold email? Did you do paid ads? Like- yeah. So I focused on paid ads because my, my skill set is in analytics. So like if, if you ever need you help barely, looking at Facebook money, ads data, right? Yeah, I barely had money, but I was so bringing took- in ad spend for my clients. So I wasn't on performance base. I put them on retainers. Um, so I had the money there. So how for much the did you spend. invest in ads? Like 20 bucks a day? Like did you um, start small? I think I started with one of those clients. I had a $750 a month budget. Um, and then with the other, so that's about 200 bucks a day, 25, or I mean, sorry, 20 bucks a day, 25 bucks a day. On the other this client. This for the clients. Yeah, this is for the clients. What about for you to get clients? Um, yeah. So for me to get clients, I jumped into a super unsaturated niche, which was my strategy. And actually you probably don't remember this, but we talked about this at the beginning and yeah, actually most of the recommendations were like, you don't have to go for an unsaturated niche. Sometimes just painting yourself as unique or different in a saturated niche can work, but I wanted the opportunity to monopolize if I could. So I went into event planning, which nobody was doing at the time. And I was getting leads for two to $3. Wow. Yeah. So it was like super, super cheap. I was very good at targeting my ads because I understood how the data worked. So I was quick to optimize my ads. And with two to $3 leads, like I had so many leads that I, I couldn't keep up with them, honestly. So I was probably spending a thousand or 1500 a month on ads. Wow. Yeah. So not so very much. And then how did, when did you hit 10K a month? How did you scale? Like, yes. So 10K came in. Did you stay in event planning? Yeah. I think 10K came like a, a about the beginning of month um, two for me. And actually it was around month four or five that COVID hit. Oh, so fuck. yeah, or maybe it was a little bit later than that. So COVID hit and I was in an, in the event, event planning. planning. Niche. <laughs> I lost all my clients at one time, right? There was nothing they could do. And most of that, that audience, those event planners weren't in the place to leverage technology, right? They're just not those type of people that were already tech savvy to start jumping into doing Dude, virtual right, well, events. That's just business in a nutshell. You're going to get punched in the face. And yeah. Open. Yeah. So I switched over to auto detailing because I had my detailing company. Oh, cool. I was running the ads for my detailing company and we were doing really well. So I was like, you know what? I can replicate this whole system that I built, my scheduling system for my detailing site, my detailing site, my um, CRM system. You right? can add built a lot of value. Level. Yeah. Yeah. And because so you know a lot about the industry. You yeah. Know? And also it's the best sales point. Like, yeah, I'm a marketer, but I also own a detailing company. So I understand you. I get it. My detailing company is actively running and actively making money right now. Right now. You want to see my schedule of booked calls? Yeah. You can, or booked appointments. You can see that right now. Wow. Yeah. So you switched over to detailing. Wait, so l- let's take a step back. So you started event planning. It's going really well. You're like, I'm going to go into an unsaturated niche and uh, COVID hits and then kind of the world shuts down. And you have to start over from scratch pretty much. Pretty much. But we actually missed one thing. So on, in one of my first lessons in Agency Lab or in the Seven Figure Agency course, you said, and it's still in there, I know because I still get contacted all the time about it. One of the first things you need to do is get a contact list, scraped contact list. Well, I told you I was developing a snowboard app. One of the first things I was trying to do with that was collect all of the snowboards from online. So I actually had already learned two years before how to data scrape. So when you instructed me to do that, I was like, oh, I can do this. I made a little system using a Google sheet and a couple of free online tools to scrape data from yellow pages. And I sent it to the community. I said, hey guys, here's my process. If you want to use it, go take it. This is how you scrape data for free. To the agency lab community. To the agency lab community. And And you added value. I added value and immediately people were like, Hey Jared, can I get a call? It's like, I'm stuck on this part. It's like, yeah. And then people started commenting, Hey, can I just give you a hundred bucks to do this for me? You know what's crazy? So for those of you guys that don't know, Jared ended up becoming one of the guys that helps all of our students get scraped data, but it all started by you adding value for free and actually saying, Hey, here's how you do it. And that wasn't even the plan. You were asking to take. 
I, I didn't even and know then I, was, I could And sell then it. when people were like, who, who's good at state, uh, scraping data? I'm like, Jared McNally's pretty damn good. And he can show you how to do it for free. But then people are like, you know what? I just would rather pay you. It's, it's complicated. It takes time, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and I didn't even expect that to happen. It wasn't my goal at all. I was just like, hey, I figured out this process. I documented it. I taught my VA how to run that process. And I was like, well, if I already made these Loom videos, I've already got the SOP. Like, let me just give it to the community. So I did. And yeah, immediately people are commenting like, hey, can I pay you a hundred bucks? And then, you know, I get on the phone with Sergio and he's like, Jared, charge more. And then I get on the phone with Omir and he's like, Jared, charge more. Right. So I started a business on, on data scraping. Um, and that was kind of floating things through COVID, right? Cause mm. we still had people, marketers that were looking for data. And even though I lost, I actually lost almost all of my marketing agency clients at one time. I still had some income from data scraping and I could go out there and make a couple hundred dollars if I needed to. Like if it was a Saturday and I was like, shit, we don't have like, enough money right now. Let me just go on Facebook real quick and DM a couple of people and I can make 200, 300 bucks right now. That's really cool. And I think like, uh, the key is not to give everything away for free. That's what, like when Hermosi says that, when I'm like, I'm on a mission to destroy the gurus by giving everything away for free. I don't mean like it's the the real underlying principle there is not give everything away for free. That's that's not the underlying first principle. The underlying first principle is add value, help people, demonstrate that you are a person that can help solve problems for other people. And I think like if you do that, the world just gives so much back to you. Yeah, definitely. I 100% agree with that. And, like and I literally, you just became earlier. like it's funny because I str I normally strike deals with like. Um, third-party vendors that want to get into agency lab and one you're probably one of the only people that ever just got it for free and <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just kind of floated and into then anytime it. I, i'm like jared i have a favor you're like here you go yeah yeah it's just <laughs> it's like really anyone nice. on the grateful. team that comes to ask me for favors like yeah we've got you yeah <laughs> but then i'm like whatever jared wants just go to him for data scraping which is really cool and yep. i just think it's 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 really nice when you just help people um so how do you get to 100k a month? Like, yeah, so I adapt, right? So the big, big thing here, I think the big message is that I just continued to adapt, right? I saw these little opportunities where my skills fit in and where I could make revenue, and so I realized pretty quickly that there were more coaches out there like you. There were a lot of people doing coaching programs, and even people that were going through Seven Figure Agency or Agency Lab um, were starting coaching programs too. And I was like, you know what, if I've already got this data. I've got the skills to do excellent media buying. And I've also got the creatives coming in pretty well. And so at this point, you know, I had, I had somebody doing our creatives. Um, why don't I just try to partner up with some coaching programs so that I don't have to do sales? Cause I, I really just didn't like sales. I don't like convincing people of things. Um, it's just not my personality, right? Like I'd rather just talk big pack, big picture strategy and let people take their own path rather than convincing them to go on mine. Um, so I wanted to stay out of sales. So I actually started a sub brand under my agency called Coach Scaler and started running some ads under that. Um, I did have some income coming in, so I was able to put some ad spend behind it. And well, what ended did you up, do? You ran ads for coaches or you? Yep. Just uh, ads for coaches that we could, you know, do their back end fulfillment or do white label if they were needing marketing. Right. So I actually paired up with to um, two different coaching programs pretty quickly and started to get some sales in through there. And my contract with them actually specified that they had to bring me a certain number of like white label clients or accounts every month. So once that started working, I was like, you know what, this is really where I want to be because I can leave out the whole sales operations side of everything from my agency and we can just be fed sales. Um, and so the coaching programs that were marketing agency coaching programs were actually becoming my focus because they were teaching people how to start a marketing agency. And then those marketing agencies were going out and try to get as many clients as they could. So one client for me would turn into three or four or five clients. So I scaled up actually pretty quickly. I think we went from like 30 K a month to 70 or 80 K a month in like two or three months. Wow. We, under, we underwent massive change in my agency. We, we like, doubled our staff count at least or tripled our staff count. So you use partnerships and affiliates to scale. Partnerships was kind of, was my big way of scaling. Yeah. That's really cool. And then you finally crossed hundred K a month. Yeah. And how crossed, long, how much time? Uh, it was probably about, uh, I would say maybe like nine or 10 months after I started the program. Wow. And then how old were you? 
I was uh, 28, 29, 29. And when did you start your first business? I actually started my very first business, which was an environmental consulting. Just It was really just me, but environmental, environmental consulting, consultancy, maybe I'll call it. Um, I started that when I was 24, right? When I got my master's degree because I was already working as just a, a contractor for several different people. And then some of my professors from school wanted to hire me for things. So I just started a little consultancy where I could bring in the money and have the tax write-offs and, and all that stuff. So uh, the, the reason I ask is I think it's really important. People think like, oh, I joined Agency Lab eight to nine months, zero to 100K a month in eight to nine months. But it's really, I just, and just to be really transparent, it took you five years from the day you started your first business. Yeah, it took me and a while. You, and you had also been building the skill of going all in and betting on yourself and having that internal confidence to push yourself in uncomfortable environments for years even before that. Yeah. And I think that um, it's really important to show the wins because I think it inspires people. And it's the truth. You know, you did hit 100K a month, but I think it's also important to give context because I know there's a lot of people watching this and they think, oh, I need to hit 100K a month in eight to nine months. But in reality, you're just seeing the final iteration or not even the final. It's like one of the higher level iterations of Jared's abilities in his businesses. Like you're going to start another business one day that's going to hit zero to 100K a month, probably even faster yeah. and go way beyond that. And it's not that, oh, my God, I started an eight figure company overnight. It's it's that you actually had the decade of experience before you started it. So when you started it, you were already had the experience, the skills, the know how, the emotional control the drive, the connections to be able to make it happen. So, yeah. So I was actually listening to, I was driving over here from Aspen, which is like a four hour drive from Denver for those of you guys that don't know. Um, and me and my, uh, one of my business partners rode along with me and we were listening to Pace Morby, who's a, a big real estate coach right now. And he actually said something cool that really resonated with me. He said, for every $10,000 that you make, you have to make a hundred mistakes. And I think that speaks very well to what you just said, right? I've, I had these decades of experience. And even before I started my own first business, I was actually running someone else's. And I've always been an ideas guy. I've always been like, how can I fix this problem? What's my idea? And what would be the path to actually make a solution? Um, but it's all of, all of those mistakes I made, all of the experience that I had that allows me to, you know, generate the income or, or the revenue that I generate today. Yeah. I think like, uh, but that's crazy, man. So 100K a month agency, you're, yeah. how, how old are you again? I'm 32 now. And then well, when you hit that 100K a month? Oh, I was 28, yeah. 29, 29 is what it was, yeah. So by the way, all the teenagers watching this, like, relax. You got some time. Yeah. <laughs> but also don't relax. You got to go all in. It's 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 both at the same time. I think that uh, uh, people just want to see, they just want the result. And it's like, you got to also just, like, know your timeline. That's why I always, whenever I share my own results, like, oh, we hit 800K a month, 400K profit. I'm like, okay, but, you know, I ran my first Google ad when I was 18, 31 now. So I've been doing marketing and business to some degree for 13 years. Mm -hmm. So so you have to also keep that context in mind. Yeah, um, 100%. You, you can, and if you actually look at, like, the uh, younger people that got really successful, they either started ultra young or they also got lucky. Sometimes you are at the right place, right time, like, if Steve Jobs didn't have Steve Wozniak, he would have never been Steve Jobs. Like, there's just no doubt about that. You needed both. Like, it, and and that's uh, I I just watched this uh, this uh, story of Howard Schultz, the guy who started not started, but the guy who took over Starbucks, and there was another guy that was going to take over Starbucks, and then Bill Gates Senior, who was like a big shot in uh, Seattle at the time, went to that guy that was going to take take it over from Howard. And he was like, if you like, I'm gonna, if you do this, I'm going to ruin your life. So it's like Howard was essentially handed Starbucks on a silver platter. Like there's a matter of luck, like yep. <laughs> just being it or maybe not even luck, but just being at the right place, right time. And, and, and yeah. So, so anyways, that being said, so you hit hundred K a month and uh, like, how has your life changed? Tell us about that. Like, and, and I want to hear about like your future plans and, and, why you started business. I know you say follow your passions, but you also took a step back to like really build a business and focus on income. So like maybe talk about that. Well, yeah. And, and so the whole time I'm building all these businesses, you know, I, I'm snowboarding every day in the winter, obviously in the summer, we can't do that, but I'm finding 
a lot of uh, a lot of joy in the freedom that I'm getting from owning my own business that is generating consistent revenue and being able to actually adjust my schedule to go snowboarding every day. So every day, you know, I'm able to wake up in the morning. Um, I did learn pretty quickly not to even look at my phone or, or try to check in on work in the morning when I get up, just get up, get ready, eat breakfast, go to the mountain and do my snowboarding for a couple hours. And being able to do what I love to do every day and what I know is, is what I really want to do every day in my life right now, even though I didn't get to do it, you know, eight hours a day, that two hours a day was so much of a boost on my morale every single day that I could go back home and hop on the computer and just start working without a problem. So I started taking um, the profit that I was getting out of the agency and putting it into some of my other business ideas, right? And into some other solutions. Um, and also trying to live a little bit of a better life because I grew up with not much and there was a lot that I think I missed out on that I could now, you know, give to myself. Like what? Um, traveling, right? Traveling comfortably and buying the things that I wanted to buy. I've got like probably close to 20 snowboards in the house right now, right? I see a snowboard that I want to try out. I buy it and I ride it and, you know, I do my research and everything. But, you know, just, and even at this point now, like I, I live in a, a very nice house, which is something that I always wanted to have for my family, right? A nice home, a comfortable place for us, something that's, you know, mostly our own. But, you know, I started taking the profit and putting it into my other business ideas and business ventures and building things. Um, and you know, that's, that's gotten me to the point now where I have five active businesses that I own and then I'm a partner in several other businesses. Um, and yeah, those are all like, are all things that are generating revenue. And some of them are, you know, just on the cusp of, of growing to be very large, more passive type of companies. That's a big goal for me right now is to get a little bit more passive because again, my goal isn't to make a billion dollars. It's to, you know, to be able to follow my passions and live, live the life that I want to live, right? Do, do what I want to do on a daily basis. So at this point I'm leaning toward more passive opportunities and that's brought me into, um, into software. So I've got a couple of softwares that we've developed out a few of them around data for marketers, right? So I've got a platform that we call easy audiences.ai. It's using AI to scrape and scour the internet for niche based leads, um, and B2C leads as well. And then we've got a, uh, basically, a uh, an identity resolution tool that we've built out called traffic to leads.ai with a, with the letter two, sorry, the number two in the middle. Um, so traffic to leads AI, nice is, plug by the way. Yeah. Just got to get those plugs <laughs> in there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a tool that basically you install a pixel on your site and he's like, we you got to make sure there's a two, you yeah. know, just in case. Yeah. Don't spell it wrong. Traffic <laughs> to leads AI. <laughs> um, but so we've got these couple software platforms that we've recently launched out and the goal there again is to build um, passive income, right? Because we've been doing this custom list scraping for um, for many years now, and you know I want to move away from so much customer service and have those more in a DIY portal. And then of course the identity resolution to collect leads, you know, name, email, phone number when they just visit your site is another big one. So what what is your sell. do you still talk to your mom? Yeah, I do. Yep. And what does she think about all this? She um she she loves what I'm doing. My family's super proud of me. And, um, yeah, they're super, super proud. Uh, but you know, still, still a little bit worried that I'm going to burn myself out by doing so much stuff like I'm doing now. And, um, yeah, they, but they're, they're supportive, right? They've seen, you know, I've found some pretty amazing success. I've definitely gone further in business and career than anyone else in my family ever has. Um, so they're, they're super supportive, uh, but always just making sure like that I'm, checking, checking my, my, um, rear view, right. And making sure that everything is, is going right, that I'm not going to mess up and, and ultimately crumble. Um, you know, the amount of stress that somebody like us handles, especially if you're running multiple businesses, it's a lot of stress, right. And it, it can definitely impact you. So they're always worried about that, but luckily I've got some really fantastic, uh, coaches and mentors in my life that help guide me through handling, you know, some of the more stressful times. All right. So Jared, you joined the program eight to nine months later, you hit hundred K a month and, uh, now you've got multiple businesses. Mm -hmm. Now you get to snowboard, spend your time with your dogs, with your fian fiance. And, uh, like if you had to go back 
to the Jared that's on that call with Sergio thinking about joining, but you're scared. Like, what would you say to that person? And I, and I don't want you to just say, do it. Like, that's like the, that's not what I mean. Like, it's more like, what did you need to hear in that moment to really bet on yourself and go all in? Yeah. I mean, I think it was mostly about having the confidence in myself that I could succeed. So I'd probably go back and tell myself, you can definitely do this. You've got the skills to make it happen. You may mess up. You may make mistakes along the way, but you can definitely do this. Um, and I honestly, I think I've had that that mindset kind of always. And I think even more recently, I've been my ego's been pushed down a little bit in that sense. Like I kind of always thought I could do pretty much anything as long as it was possible in the realm of physics. <laughs> um, but it, it turns out that's not not always true. But to some degree, it is right. Like if you really have your mindset on something, if you're willing to problem solve enough, you're going to find a way through it. That's cool, man. And um, how, how do you feel like your your future is going to change from all this? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I've been definitely put on a completely different path since I started my marketing agency. Um, that's been my cash cow. That's been my uh, my foundation. Actually, I've got, I've got a mindset coach. He's a really amazing guy. His name's Jeff Spencer. Have you heard of him? Well, he was like the coach of like Michael Jordan and Lance Armstrong and Bono from U2, right? Like worked with some of the most successful people in the world. And he's got this idea, this concept, um, called the stable planet, right? So if you can create a world of your own that is stable, that is making your life stable, then you can step away and start creating these other planets. But you need to have your staple planet first. And my marketing agency has been that. That's been my consistent source of revenue and profit for me to go and do the other things that I wanted to do, for me to have the freedom to do the other things, whether that's going snowboarding, you know, buying a, you know, buying stuff, right, buying a new car or, um, you know, spending time with my family more on my terms. Um, my stable planet is what's allowing me to do that. And now around my stable planet, I've got all these other little planets, which are maybe like my side hustles or my other little businesses um, that I can start to expand with. Right. And, and this is really just, it's a process of diversifying once you have one thing stable. Right. Mm. And I think, you know, one, one concept, and we were just talking about this a couple minutes ago off air. Um, one concept that this brings in is like, you know, you hear all the, the wealthiest people in the world and how they're investing their money. Well, when you're a, a newbie entrepreneur, when you're getting started up, you don't have a bunch of money. What you do have is time to dedicate to things. And what I realized pretty quickly was I had, I didn't have the money, but I had the time that I could put into things that would make me money. And if I diversified how I spent my time, then I would have different sources of income that would be more stable if something went wrong in the world or if something went wrong in one or more of those different planets outside of my stable planet that I would still be okay. Right. And, and that definitely like that happened during COVID, right? I had a couple sources of income, a couple of them got, you know, knocked out completely by COVID like most businesses in the U S um, and around the world, but a couple of them still functioned pretty well and, and almost completely fine. So that diversification is, you know, is something that I'm going to continue to carry forward, making sure that myself and my family are going to be safe if something goes wrong. Wow. And then you, um, uh, with this coach, this is a question I wanted to ask, what are, what, what do you say is like another huge lesson that you learned? Cause not everyone gets to have that mindset coach. I think, I mean, I'm curious to Oh man, I've, I've like, learned what are some things that, what are some of the biggest lessons? Yeah, I've learned so much from him. Uh, but I would say probably the biggest thing is really understanding my why, why am I doing what I'm doing? And this is something that, you know, we've been working on. I think I've been pretty confident in my why for, you know, the last several years, but even more so the last year, year and a half, two years. I've been really focused on my why. Why am I doing things? Why am I in business? Why am I trying to make money? And if I am trying to make money, how much am I trying to make? Like, why do I need that much money, right? I don't need a billion dollars, at least not at this point in my life, because I don't even know what I would do with it. I know how much money I would like to have on an annual basis right now to live the lifestyle I want. And that's my goal, right? So that's my why. I want to be able to spend my time with my family. I want to snowboard and I want to have enough money coming in that we can live the life we want to live. That's really cool. Um, let's let's shift to some like practical stuff. So you started your agency. If you had to go back and start it from zero and get it to 10K a month as fast as humanly possible, like world record, what would you do? 
Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> I would, um, I'd probably sell uh, a few people, right? Probably two people on a kind of all-inclusive uh, marketing and web system. I'd probably go to, to Google My Business, find some businesses that look like they could be pretty successful, right? Like that they have some good reviews, but don't actually have a website. And especially a lot of those small local brick and mortar businesses uh, don't have a scheduling system, right? And that's something new to them or they don't have a payment processing system. So I'd build them that and then bring them clients with marketing services. So I'd probably sell two 5k packages per month to two people. Um, Why not I think one I could do that 10k easy. package? Uh, it's, it's a little easier, especially when you're starting from scratch. If you don't have, um, if you don't have case studies, if you don't have uh, proof that, you know, you can do what you say you're going to do, you're starting a new relationship with somebody, a new business relationship. So 5k you think is the most you can get as, I think as I could get more out. than that, but I think that would be an easy sell while not spending a ton of time to build a relationship first. If you're going to sell somebody on something for 10,000, 20,000 a month, 30,000 a month, right? Like my biggest client has paid me at one point over a hundred thousand dollars a month in one month. Wow. So like getting somebody to spend that much money with you, actually it, it takes a, a lot of relationship building, right? And if how, you're how trying you, to get what to are that, some unique ways that beginners can add value? from your perspective, and I'm happy to chime in here too, even if they're just starting out. Yeah, I mean, if they're just starting Assuming out. Assuming they know high level, they can learn how to do Google review campaigns, which we all teach in my free course. Like, what are some things that you feel like could be a, way, a good foot in the door value add just to like start to build that relationship? Yeah, I mean, we, and you and I talked about it a little bit earlier, doing something like a Google review campaign or a reactivation campaign is a great way to generate revenue immediately, right? It's, it's really just numbers based. If they've got a volume of clients or old customers, previous customers, you can definitely convert some of those, whatever that is. You know, it may be different niche per niche or, you know, person per person. Um, but I would probably add some value in that way. I would also you know, maybe the first thing I would do would actually be go, I'm, I'm very big into AI and, you know, right now we're developing a couple of our own AI platforms. We've already developed a few, um, but I would probably just go to ChatGPT and use ChatGPT to, you know, bring extreme efficiency to me learning about the niche, right? And mm. learning about what those people need and then giving them for free marketing tips and marketing advice that is tuned to the industry, right? Or, or even more specifically to their business if possible. Right. And, and that's how I would try to bring value right off the bat um, and start to build relationships because uh, sales at the end of the day, it is about relationships, right? Especially high ticket sales. You know, it's fascinating. Everyone overcomplicates going out and getting clients. They think they have to do this crazy thing. I don't like, I don't care if you're 15. I don't care if you're 16. I don't care if you're 21 years old. I don't care if you're 40 years old. I don't care if you're 60 years old. If you're starting an SMMA, like one of the easiest ways to get your foot in the door is to find ways to add value. And something you mentioned, you literally said, oh, if you go on Google My Business, there's businesses that don't even have a website. So mm -hmm. you could literally reach out and be like, hey, I made this for you. Do you want this website? Don't you think that'll be a great way to get in the door? And now they're like, oh my God, this person's amazing. And how much, how long would it take you to literally take a template off of Go High Level that already exists, slap on their logo and boom, you've got Ooh. a website. Literally, it'll take you like, five minutes, quite literally five minutes. So five minutes to get your foot in the door. That seems like a pretty good trade for me where you go in, you add value first and you give before you take. Yep. You don't 100%. think they're going to pay you after that? Or yeah, at least or eight, let's say you do this for 10 people. Fine. Five minutes for 10 people. That's fi you know, 50 minutes, an hour, an hour. You don't think out of 10 people, you build a free website for that took you five minutes each. You reach out, you send it in an email. Hey guys, you know, Hey John, I, I made, uh, I noticed on your Google, my business, you guys didn't have a website. So I went ahead and made this template for you. If you guys want me to go ahead and set it up, I'm more than happy to do that free of charge. Just let me know. Thanks. That's the email. You can literally take it, steal it right now. I guarantee you, if you do that for enough businesses, you're going to get a client because at the end of the day, they're going to be like, well, what else can you do for us? We could do Google yeah. reviews. We could set up go high level. We could do ads. Et cetera, and, et cetera. and it's not just that if you keep giving them value over and over again, like when I write email sequences or when my team writes email sequences, what we focus on is a long-term sequence, right? A lot of messages and start sending those out and add value in every single one. We're not even trying to sell in these emails. 80, 80% the rule with my company is 
80% of our emails need to be value focused. They can still have a call to action, but the call to action is not allowed to be the main focus of the email. But if we keep providing value, whether they're ready to buy now or not, when they come to a problem, they're going to remember that you're the subject matter expert, right? That you're the expert in this and that you could actually do this for them because you already gave them a simplified free roadmap to doing that at some point in time. That's really cool. Yeah, I think, um, how would you go out and get the clients? Would you do cold email? Like you said, two clients at 5K to get the 10K. Would you do cold email? Would you do paid ads? Would you go into a niche? What would you do? Yeah, personally, I would... That's a, that's a good question. I would probably run paid ads because that's where I'm, I'm strongest suited personally. Uh, but I think an even easier way would be to go to your local community because starting a sales conversation with somebody you have anything in common with is way easier than starting a sales conversation with somebody that just popped into your high level account because they filled out a Facebook lead form. Right. So if you can go to businesses in your local area, in your local city, um, in maybe your county or even bigger, right? Somebody just that's in your state, um, you can start the conversation by saying, yeah, like, hey, I live right down the street. I saw that you're here. You've got your business. You don't have a website or, you know, whatever it may be. But that opens the door for a much easier conversation, right? And I think, you know, even if you don't sell those people, you can get valuable information from them because they already have some tie and some relationship to you, even if it's your first time talking, right? Like, yeah, you're both from the same place. Yeah, you both ate at that same restaurant last week. You love that place, right? Mm. And now you can start that conversation. And whether or not they're ready what to if buy. You're in, uh, what if you're in another country? If you're in another country, oh, that's interesting. I would I would probably run paid ads, yeah, yeah. and provide value. Paid ads with a lead magnet on the front end marketing. Really? Free okay, cool. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, I think because everyone's going to be like, well, that only works if you're in the United States. So I had to ask, yeah, well, no, what if you're not in the United States? That's a great question. I wouldn't have even thought of that one. <laughs> okay, well, what if you can't run paid ads? Because people are also going to say that. Yeah. Um, would you do cold email? Would you do Loom videos? Would you like fly a pigeon across yeah, I mean, the I, cold email is ac- always across a cheap the Atlantic Ocean, and then <laughs> cold email is always a cheap and easy way to get started. It's something that you can spend a couple hours getting set up and just have it on autopilot. So I would definitely do that. That's one of my go-to strategies. And a lot of people say that it's dead right now, but all of those people also have shifted all of their marketing to other channels, right? And they're doing other things, running paid ads or doing organic on social media. And they've decided that cold email doesn't work, thus leaving the door open for everyone else that still wants to run run cold email and, and it can be done successfully still today. Cool. Would you go into a niche? What would you do? Um, me personally, I wouldn't go into a niche because, you know, my agency has been a white label agency for many years now. We focused across um, pretty much every niche that you can imagine. Uh, so my personal biggest skill is looking at a big picture problem that a small business has and building um, or compiling uh, is maybe a better word the ideal marketing strategy for them, the thing that I think is going to work best. So I wouldn't go after a specific niche because um, I don't think that I I really need to with the experience Mm, that I've had in marketing so far. Love it. And then what if you didn't have any experience? How would you go and get experience? Would you try to find a mentor? Would you try to work for free? Would you try to, again, start by adding value in simple ways? Yeah, I think I would do free trials and um, use my first few clients to start the learning process and just be transparent with them. Like, hey, I'm pretty new to this, but because I'm new, I'm willing to give you a free trial and we can learn to do this together, right? Frame it as a partnership, frame it as something where we both might have an upside, but there may also be a downside. Like, let's be honest, we may fail. I've never done this before, but if we win, it'll be a really great deal for you right at the beginning. And you'll be helping me a lot. I'll be helping you a lot. Right. That could literally be the cold email script, by the way, like that entire thing. So I think, I think people tend to overcomplicate it. So you went through my free seven figure agency course that literally shows you how to go from zero all the way to a hundred thousand dollars per month. And, you know, you had invested into it with a whole coaching program. This was before I gave it away for free. Now I give it away for free and people don't take action. Why do you think that is? And why do you think people are so skeptical? Honestly, and this goes back to something we said a few minutes ago, or I said a few minutes ago, it's because they don't have their why defined. They don't know what they're doing and why. For me, it's always been very clear. I know what my why is. I know where my goal is, right? I'm, I'm trying to make X amount of dollars that I can have in assets that generate passive income for me so I don't have to work anymore, right? So I have my why, it's to snowboard, to do what I wanna do, spend time with my family. And the end goal, right, there's an end point to that, gives me 
gives me a metric to look at. How close am I to that to that goal right now? Well, I know how close I am to that goal right now. And I can predict, okay, maybe it's going to take me three more years or four more years to get to that goal. But I think that why is the driving motivator that you can look to every day to put in the extra work, right? Running an agency is not fun every day, right? Like it's definitely not fun every yeah, day. Yeah, no one it's ever wakes exciting. up thinking, oh, I want to do SMA. Yeah, That's or, my passion. Or nobody wakes up and says, yes, I'm so stoked. I'm going to have a client call me today and they're going to cuss me out and they're going to be so mad. And I'm still just so excited to handle that. <laughs> yeah, or right? like, like, I'm so excited I'm to so deal excited with that. I'm so excited to go today. into the ads manager and then, oops, we're banned we're again. We're banned. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's my passion. No one thinks yeah. that. You know, this has been a vehicle for me just to get closer and closer to my goals. And, you know, some people love marketing. I'm pretty good at it, but it's not my why. I'm pretty good. And I figured okay. out how I can I, leverage I, it to make money and to get closer to my why, to get closer to my end goal so that I can be fulfilled and feel fulfilled in my life. And I think so many people misunderstand when I say don't follow your passion. What I really mean is don't follow your passion first, especially if you don't have the resources, because then it's a trap. You're always going to be needing more resources, but you're trying to follow your passion, but you need more resources, but you're trying to follow your passion. And I think like even you, you've, you've really helped me see like, look, you have to really know your why and follow your passion and do what you love, but it's a matter of sequence. Yeah, it's a matter it, of sequence. You have, to, you have to put in some work to get to your passion and that's okay, right? And it may, it may be you grinding for years, right? You, I know you have been and I know I've been as well. Dude, I'm feeling exhausted. I'm starting to feel burnt out. It's been many years that I've been grinding my ass off without like a, a real great break, right? And we put all this energy in, but if we're working towards something we can see that finish line in sight. It's somewhere, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I know that every bad day, every mistake, every dollar lost, and by the way, it's been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that I lost by making mistakes. Um, that's that's rough, but it's all just on the path to get me to my my goal and my my why. I love it, man. 10K a month to 100K a month, how do you do it? Do 10K to 100K? Three tips. Yeah recycle all of your money back into prospecting and don't do one one prospecting channel you have to focus on omni channel prospecting and yeah you don't have a business without sales right so it's not all about making sales but if you're not making sales you don't you don't have a business at the end of the day so you have to be okay to invest in yourself invest everything you've got if you're eating ramen and you just hit 10k a month keep that's eating that's when people that buy the ramen. rolex watch by the way yeah keep I'm eating like, what that the fucking fuck ramen. is wrong with you literally hit 10k a month one time you bought a rolex idiot that, <laughs> I, that someone in my program did that i said return it yeah like, go resell it like you don't need the watch take, you know? take that money put it back into <laughs> like, making more money like 10k a month one time and you buy a Rolex watch it is so wrong like that is borderline <laughs> illegal like it, we should make it illegal you should go to jail yeah <laughs> you, you, should, you should just like lose you should automatically that's like the the way to just uh lose the game you're not allowed to do business anymore sorry you went to business jail anyways um it, we have to we we have to educate the audience cuz it's like you you if you if you can buy you know, someone the other day was like, Joel, why don't you get a Lambo? I'm like, look, I can get 10 Lambos in cash right now, but I don't want a Lambo. And it's like, I think everyone lives by this like lifestyle, like the cars, the watches, well, all that stuff. And it's like, that's not the, you can enjoy it. You know, I like watches, well, but it's not, the, that's not the that's end goal. Flashy. That shouldn't be why you're doing this. Like I just got a lot. I got a few Rolexes because Rolexes, because I wanted to get it at some point after having millions of dollars, not because of that being the, my why. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of these people that younger people, especially that are hitting 10 K a month and then going and buying the Rolex, maybe you're like, no, Joel, you're wrong. Like I, I can buy this Rolex. It's an asset. It appreciates. If you don't have any money, you don't need to be buying assets. Keep taking your money and putting it into growing your business so that rather than making 10 K a month, you're making 70 or 80 or 90 or hundred K a month. And then you have an extra $10,000 a month after you already went on a fucking amazing vacation, after you moved into a bigger house, nicer house. And after you have everything you want, you've still got 10 grand to play with every single and, month. And if you are literally a teenager or in your early twenties and you're taking all of the money that you make and reinvesting it into watches or into Lambos and Ferraris in order to flex it on a bunch of other people so you could sell more courses, that's just borderline unethical you know like or really no i think it is unethical and you know one of the reasons i've made it my mission to give away all my courses 
for free is to fight against that. Cause I think our industry gets such a bad rap. People really think like, Oh my God. Um, you know, there's some bad players and I, th I think there are. So it's like, look, put your money where your mouth is. Show us how you can actually teach people as, as opposed to just showing the lifestyle, just showing the watches, just showing the Lambos. So anyways, um, so speaking of uh, college, you said you're a big college guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge proponent of traditional education. And I know that most of your audience is not actually. I don't I wouldn't say that. I think like, I, I think there are, I, I just... I'll tell you my fundamental belief. I don't think there are, I think a lot of teachers want to do good. You know, I've, I've, like I mentioned to you, I've been to hundreds of high schools all across the country, low income, high income, uh, suburban city, like every type of high school you could imagine, big high schools, small high schools, charter schools, like, uh, sign, uh, you know, uh, what's uh, the word for the science driven schools? I forget the, like Montessori schools or something like I've, that? I've been to Montessori schools. Like, anyways, every type of school that you could imagine, I've, uh, I've, I've been to those. And what's really interesting is that even if people had the best intentions and wanted to help the students, the, systems is, the system is set up for everyone to fail because the teachers don't even have the freedom to do things in the way that they believe is going to actually help the students. You know, I had one principal who's amazing, and he actually... Uh, told me the reason he's been able to build the, one of the best schools is because he lies to the district about what they're actually up to in the day to day. And he just does a bunch of crazy shit. He told me one day he turned the entire gym into this like mat. They, they, they spent all a bunch of money on getting like, uh, these like blow up, uh, playgrounds with like slot, crazy slides and yeah, things bounce for the houses and shit, but, but like some <laughs> crazy ones. And, uh, he, he told me that uh, the district would think it's a massive liability. They can't do that. It's really dangerous. You can't use the budget for that. And he said, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to do what I think is best for the students. And guess what? The kids actually want to show up every day. They're excited. It's fun. It's not just like the same old thing every single day that you have to sit in one little chair and you know, do as you're told and you can't get up. And if you get up, then you're labeled as ADHD, that there's something wrong with you. And, uh, yeah, so I, th I think more so it's not that I believe the, the, the players within education are bad. I actually think there are a lot of good people that want to do good. I just think the entire, the fundamental underlying principle of how the system is set up is, is flawed. That's my, my yeah, belief. And, and I think in the public school system, especially at like the high school level, that's definitely very clear and apparent. I'm, I'm lucky to have gone to a pretty good school that had good options for me to take advantage of great teachers, right? I took a lot of AP classes and stuff like that in high school, but moving into the university world and, um, and graduate school as well, you know, there are people that have actually dedicated their, their lives. Those professors aren't just there because they want to be. And in fact, they would make a whole lot more money doing something else, working in the private sector, being a scientist or being an expert in some way, you know, if they're outside of the science world, um, but what do you think about business teachers or business professors that never started a business? Yeah, I think that's not, not a good place to be. I think experience is super, super important in your professors. And I actually never took a business class. I've never taken a business class. Um, so I can't speak to it too much, but what I found the biggest value in college was for me and especially in grad school was that I was taught how to learn and that skill of learning how to learn allowed me to do whatever I want to do, right? I can, I can honestly say that I can learn. I, I'm pretty confident I can learn anything that I would like to learn right now. I'm learning about real estate investing and that's not super difficult, right? A lot of people can do that. Um, but when you talk about environmental chemistry and how pollutants are moving around and changing in the atmosphere and how those move into the water and everything like that, things get pretty, pretty complex. Um, but what I was really taught in school wasn't how those balloons move around. It was how to understand what's going on, how to learn and find the information I need to, to truly understand something. And then how to leverage that knowledge to get some result out of it. Would you say you love learning? I, by far, yeah, I a hundred percent love learning. That's, that's who I am at my core. Not, I'm not a to learner. get to, uh, I don't want to get into a debate, but do you think that also is a bias in terms of saying that college is great? Um, cause obviously someone that loves to learn is going to have a great experience no matter what you're yeah, learning. Yeah. I, and I think that definitely plays into it. There's certainly a bias there. Uh, but I think if you 
have your why in your mind, even if that changes over time, that's totally okay. If you have your why in your mind as you're learning, the learning isn't difficult, right? I think a lot of people dread going to school because yes, in high school and public school and middle school, we were forced to do something which our teachers didn't even agree with a lot of the time, Correct. Yeah, yeah. right? We were forced to do that. So we all have this bad rap of what learning has to be, but learning can come in a different way and you can use that learning to get what you want in life. And it, was, it wasn't until I realized that I could use my skill of learning, just like when I said, I taught, right? I gave a freebie away to the community on how to do list scraping. That was just because I knew how to learn quicker than other people, right? Mm. And that's that's one of my core skills. So now that I've realized that, I can take anything, like for example, AI, and I can teach it, right? I I do live live talks on AI, and I you know I teach AI in my coaching courses all the time, right? And in my consulting, I talk about AI all the time. But I don't have a degree in that. I haven't had any formal education but I do know how to learn about it and I've been able to find the information I need to. In fact, ChatGPT taught me how to understand AI. I literally opened up a conversation with ChatGPT to understand how it worked so that I could leverage it for everything that I'm doing. Do you believe that someone that doesn't know what they wanna do in life and doesn't have the funds to go to college should go into debt? I, I think there's huge benefit in going to a university um, and going to college, uh, maybe pick a cheaper one, but there's a significant part of becoming an adult and learning how to be social in an educated network that you can get out of going to college, whether or not you do a good job there. Um, you can definitely get an amazing network and grow as a human being. I think if you're in that, you know, just fresh out of high school age, 18 to 20 years old, and you think that there's something you could gain out of college, even if it's just learning how to learn, regardless of the topic, there's some huge benefit in that. Like you get to learn how to be an adult, get, get the fuck out of your parents' basement, out of your parents' house and start learning how to take care of yourself. Can you even do your laundry? All right. Can you feed yourself? Can you stay responsible enough to show up to class when, when mom and dad aren't there um, bitching at you? And those are all life skills that have helped me to be completely responsible for myself and for my businesses. Right. Um, and I don't think I would have gotten those if I hadn't moved out of my grandparents' house and into a dorm with other people. Yeah, like my, my philosophy, like I do believe everyone should learn science, learn math, learn these like, you know, core, uh, you know, uh, bodies of knowledge. But I think the the problem is not so much the learning, it's how it's being taught mm -hmm. and, and also not understanding the root problems. Like most kids show up and they, they don't, they have problems at home, they don't wanna be there they're completely disengaged. And then it's like, you're just shoving information down their throat, learn this, memorize this. And then what happens is number one, they don't actually learn it. And uh, it's just not effective. And, and it's not tailored to the individual. And I think solving that problem is extremely hard. I'm not saying it's easy, it is absolutely hard. I actually wanted to solve the education problem. That's how I worked for uh, the billion dollar uh, Cisco family wh who donates all their money to the education system and why I joined the net tech company for two years, going around all these schools. But I think that I realized, holy shit, if I wanna have impact, I'm gonna have to leave, I have to go out. I, I have to play with a new set of rules. I, I, I can't play with, with their set of rules because the set of rules are flawed. Um, I also like believe that you need lawyers, you need doctors, you need these people, you know, you mm -hmm. need therapists that do need advanced training. But, but I think there's a lot of people that don't know what they wanna do they're lost and then they just go to college because that's what's being told is the right thing to do. And they don't actually take the time to question what their why is and maybe they don't even wanna be there. So then they end up wasting their time and even worse their money and now they're in debt for years and years and years to come. That's that's my fundamental problem with it. And I think that, uh, you, you know, you said the word against traditional education. I, I'm actually not a, for it or against that. I think it depends on the individual. I think it's it's, it is relative to the situation. It's not so black or white. I just I think it has some inherent flaws that aren't being addressed. That's a much more accurate statement. Yeah, I can definitely, I definitely hear you and on I appreciate that. your perspectives too, by the way. This is good. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I think graduate school is a different thing, right? So if somebody's looking to go into a master's uh, or a doctorate degree, the teaching style changes massively. Like I don't, I, I think I had hardly had any tests during my master's degree because our professors, their goal wasn't to hammer information into us. It was to help us to, especially in science, 
help us to be able to uncover and understand a problem, right? That's what science is. It's just understanding. So they weren't forcing us and asking us like, do you remember, did you memorize this thing, right? Or like if I was in a biology class, it wasn't, did you memorize how ATP works, right? No, it was, do you know the process to learn and figure out what this problem is and relay it in a way to somebody that could to, could fix that problem, right? And if you're the person that has ideas to fix it as well, that's totally fine. So I think there's there's a difference between high school and then getting into college and in a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree, and then you know the advanced higher level um, you know graduate school education. Uh, but you know I think it's it's different for everybody. And maybe my thought you know to to come to a middle ground between this. If somebody's young, if they're, you know, 18 to 20 and they don't really know what they want to do with their life, it's really hard to define their why. But if you do see value, but that also in being starts, able to learn, that also starts a few years before, right? Which is like the, the, the negative cycle, right? If throughout all of high school, which are some of the most important years to develop who you are as an individual, like you're being shut down, you're being told no, you're being mm -hmm. told to just live in this box. It's actually, you haven't developed any muscle in your brain to say, this is who I am and this is what yeah, I want. Yeah, and, and that's part of it. And that's why I would probably recommend, like, if you know that you could do well in school, if you see value in being able to learn, going to study any science, whether it's a computer science or in earth science or chemistry or physics, those type of majors will teach you how to learn, right? And of course, you'll be learning about that topic very much. But what you're really learning is how to problem solve. And that's where you can come into business and start to solve problems much better than other people. And, you know, I would say with pretty good confidence that I am a better problem solver than most business people because most scientists don't move into business, right? Scientists are trained to understand a problem and understand how to start to solve it. Um, and that's what I think a lot of people are missing is so if you want to get good at business, don't go to business problems. school. Yeah, I would highly recommend not going to business degree. school. Yeah, get a biology, well, a, any that's science. That's a plot twist. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a plot twist. But I even, like, I, I had met somebody um, a few months ago that... But I really a, appreciate that perspective, you know. Yeah. I, that's really cool. I think, you know, I went, I remember taking a... You know, I come from a Hispanic family. It's like college, college, college. Mm -hmm. And I went to a business class, and they were like, this is how you shake someone's hand. It's like, what the fuck? That's ridiculous. <laughs> like, that's not going to solve any of your fucking problems. No, like, <laughs> that's not teaching you. You know, it's, it, I don't, it was just. Like, when as a CEO, have you ever thought, I need to shake someone's hand the right way? No, never, you like, know. <laughs> you know, and if they, give me the, fist bumps. if they give me the limp, if they give me the limp handshake, I'm like, I guess we're going to roll with that. You know, if they give me the ultra strong, I'm going to murder you handshake. Like, I guess we roll with that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It just is what it is. It's a fucking handshake. It doesn't matter in terms of your business. Um. But yeah, I think if you can learn how to solve problems, you can go do anything you want, right? Elon Musk, I think, is one of the best entrepreneurs ever to live on this planet because he's focused on solving problems, right? What he does I is I really appreciate problems. that. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like, maybe you could take a, a scientific lens through, you know, or put business through a scientific lens, and I think maybe you'll even get better outcomes, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, like, um, I actually saw a video of yours the other day where you were talking about, like, the 10 things that all, business, all businesses need to do to be successful, and one of those was looking at your data. That's another thing. If you get into a science yeah, major you look into data and you start to learn how to interpret and understand data. And when you have four years of practice or six years of practice doing that, or you go into a career where you're doing that, looking at data just becomes like easier even than reading a book. Like I can look at Facebook business manager and know what's going on with any, any ad account in one or two minutes. Cause I'm very comfortable seeing data. And That's really data. cool. And I think, uh, again, it's really easy for, influencers to be like college bad college good i think i think the the key is and what i've said this before in other videos the key is to get really clear on who you are and what you want yeah but and that's also the hardest part yeah and you shouldn't expect to do that in your teenage years or even in your early 20s Why not? And you don't have enough experience to really know, know what 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 is out there in life a lot of people haven't traveled and seen the rest of the world seen how other people live i, I, th and I think i think i'm still I think, developing no, for sure. But I think people could have a more clear, obviously they can't figure that problem out, but I think they could have a more clear understanding of who they are and what they want. You know, if they spend more of their time growing up 
thinking about those things. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's a great thing to think about. I also just caution everybody to know that you're going to change. Like we all change every sure. day, every year. Like we're always evolving and adapting and, and becoming different people. So it's okay if your plan originally or right now, let's say you're 18 years old, it's okay if you say, okay, I want to build you know, an SMMA. I want to build an SMMA, right? And if that changes a couple of years down the road, that is totally fine, right? You should be continuing to follow your passion and be looking forward to your goals and be willing to accept that those goals are changing. For example, I have one of my employees in my agency. Um, she's actually my director of operations from Ecuador, hired her as a VA for 600 bucks a month to get started. It was, might have even been less than that. And she is actually just finishing her master's degree in psychology because her goal was always to be a psychologist, a, you know, a, a clinical psychologist. And at this point, right, she's been going to school and she's almost done with her master's, but she's shifted to saying, you know what, I'm actually very good at this operation stuff. She's running my agency, right, for the most part. Um, maybe I can spend most of my time doing operations for a business and then spend part of my time now doing what I always thought I was going to do, right? What I thought I was going to do when I was in high school and through college and now through my master's. It's okay if the goal changes, but just focus on something, be working towards something. And, you know, if, if you can bring your skill of learning into that, if you can learn how to learn efficiently, um, you'll be able to do really whatever you want to do or solve any problem that you want to solve and, and get yourself to where you want to be. If you could, last question, and then we'll wrap up. If you could go back to that, you know, nine-year-old self that was having to cook dinners and you were having really tough childhood growing up, what would you tell yourself? I would tell myself to, um, to hang in there and to focus on, on building up my skills and leveraging what I know I'm good at to get the things that I really want. I probably would have encouraged myself to go out there and try to become a pro surfer like I wanted to be, right? Or a pro skater like I wanted to be when I was that age. And still today, right, I, I'm still wishing that I was a pro athlete, right? And, and at this point, yes, I get to give myself back some time and energy and money toward toward that vision and that goal. But let's be real, I'm a little bit too old to be a, a pro athlete. And that's okay, you know, I've accepted that. But I can see how far I'm going to take it. That's cool. Yep. Sweet. I think that's it. Well, thanks for having me on. Absolutely.